This is episode number 186. Today, we're featuring Timothy Standring, the curator emeritus of the Denver Art Museum, art historian, author, and plein air painter. This is the Plein Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plein Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. Yep. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Well, thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plen Air podcast. Happy September, everybody. Seems like this summer went by pretty rapidly. This is kind of the year that never was. Things were simply not very normal this year, nor are they now. But anyway, the best part for me is I got a lot of painting done more than normal, even though I still work from home. It's a beautiful thing to be able to get some painting done. I am really looking forward to fall. And as it stands at this moment, my annual artist retreat fall color week is going to happen live in person. It's unbelievable. We thought we would have nothing going on in person this year, but it looks like it's going to take place. The, uh, the resort we've taken over is going to be all ready for it. They're taking all the precautions. We're taking precautions. Of course, most of our time is painting outside and we're painting for the first time in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, where the Hudson River School painters painted their famous fall scenes. And we have artist Eric Capel working with us and helping us. Even though it's not a workshop, he's going to be there. He's going to show us his favorite spots. And we have a full house, or almost. We have a few people who have dropped out because of COVID. But I think we have 12 seats left. And if you want to go, we would love to have you. And of course, if you have to cancel for any reason because of COVID, et cetera, we understand, and uh, we would give you all your money back. So you just got to sign up at fallcolorweek.com, all right? Now, speaking of signing up, everyone is doing it. Everybody is signing up for Realism Live. We had done Plein Air Live. It was a huge success. We decided by, by noticing that people were doing a lot of other kind of painting too, we decided to create a Realism Conference this coming October. And it's an incredible lineup and it's about the topics you want to learn. It's got landscape, studio landscape, plein air painting, of course, still life, floral painting, figures, portraits, color theory, so, so much more, all from very, very top artists. And we're able to get these people in this kind of a lineup this year, probably because of COVID. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway, uh, there are going to be uh, more, uh, more announced soon, but Kathy Anderson, Juliet Aristides, Stefan Bauman, uh, Tony Serenai, Mark D'Alessio, Rose Franson, Dan Gerhartz, Dan Graves, Cornelia Hernes, Victoria Herrera, Joshua LaRock, uh, Jeff Legg, uh, Kathy Odom, Graydon Parrish, William A. Schneider, Daniel Sprick, Joan Stern, Connor Walton, Peter Trippi, and me, of course, as your host. It is four amazing days, and it's all virtual, so you can watch from the comfort of your home. And we have uh, international components. We've got people watching from 30, 40, 50 countries. We're going to have teachers from other countries. And there's a fifth optional day for beginners, and including on all of these, there's going to be interaction. So you're going to be able to interact with one another, interact with our, our suppliers and vendors and sponsors. So make sure that you visit realismlive.com and get that seat booked because the price goes up $200 as of September 30th. And you want to make sure you get in for that. Coming up after the interview, I'm going to be answering your art marketing questions in the marketing minute. But first, let's get to our interview with Timothy Standring, curator emeritus of the Denver Art Museum and also a plein air painter. Timothy Standring, welcome to the plein air podcast. Eric, it's so great to be here with you. Uh, I think this is going to be a real interesting podcast because you're the first person that I think I've ever interviewed that blends a whole lot of worlds together. You, you are the uh, curator uh, emeritus from the Denver Art Museum, having recently retired. Congratulations. 
Uh, you Thank are you. an art historian. You are an author and expert about certain artists, and you're a plein air painter. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Well, I, I hope so, and I hope so for your listeners. Um, but uh, I, I found that the two go hand in hand, and, and actually my own practice has informed how I write about artists and art history. You know, I think that that's a really great place to start because one of the things that really perturbs me um, and, and it is that uh, so often you go to an art museum and you'll read uh, what a curator has written about uh, a particular artist and what that artist was thinking about or what signals he or she was putting into her paintings. And, and, <clears throat> and, and a lot of these people have really great backgrounds and, and really understand art history, but most of them have never painted. And so, you know, sometimes I kind of feel like they're just trying to fill space. How do you, how do you kind of bridge that? What was, what was it about painting that really helped you see things from a different perspective or did it? Uh, well, I, I, I really wanted to understand um, how, uh, how uh, I want to understand how artists make their, their paintings. And if, and so um, for example, with Degas, he, uh, used a great deal of repetition. He would um, he he had ad- affirmation and cancellation uh, in terms of his mark making. He was he was all over the map, and I wanted to understand the basis for that and how how that informed him um, in his his works of art, his pastels, his oils, uh, and his drawings, and how that really worked throughout his entire career. The same thing with old master painters with, uh, in addition to 19th century painters and even uh, 20th century painters. So I've written on contemporary artists, uh, Dan Sprick, uh, Keith Jacobs, Hagen, uh, Scott Frazier, uh, T. Allen Lawson and uh, Andrew and Jamie Wyeth. And I spent an enormous amount of time just uh, lingering in their studios, reading everything that I could, but I, I still wanted to get to the heart of of how they approach painting and what that meant to the final picture. Remember um, uh, uh, Ben Sean's book, uh, Shape is the Form of Content, which still resonates with me. And it's so true because uh, what an artist, how an artist constructs painting really has something to do with the meaning if they're bringing it across. And, and I really wanted to deal with that. I'm except I allow different kinds of narratives for works of art, but the kind of art history that I write is based on, on how the technical means and all the challenges that artists overcome when they make their own works. And so when, when I was writing about Andrew and Jimmy Wyeth, I spent an enormous amount of time learning about watercolor painting and trying to uh, imitate what Andrew Wyeth was doing. And that really gave me huge insight as to the challenges and the problems that he had. I mean, uh, you know, when he said, well, um, it took me 20 minutes to do this watercolor, but I'm completely exhausted. I can't do anything else the rest of this day. And I know exactly now <laughs> what he's talking about. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so did so the, please inter- uh, interrupt me. Let's, let's back up for just a second, uh, because I'm curious sure. when that journey began, which came first, the, uh, the, uh, the curator or the artist? Um, it's, um, it's a braided narrative. I was a studio major in, as an undergrad, a painter, and for some reason or other, I didn't think it was that challenging. So I turned to art history, which was hugely challenging and difficult for me uh, because writing doesn't come naturally to me. I work so hard with it. Uh, but I've painted watercolors now for about 40 years, but only in the past five or six years that I really began to think seriously. And thanks to uh, many of your efforts and the 
the little seminars and the events that take place all across the nation, those have been hugely informative uh, for me. And and then I've, I've networked in the Denver community where there's a really great sense of camaraderie and sharing among uh, many artists um, about t- trials and techniques. So um, it was studio first, art history, graduate degrees, uh, a career at the Denver Art Museum for 30 years, organizing 20 exhibitions. Um, but now I'm trying to balance back and paint more. <laughs> so you, you just I'm recently retired, retired from, from that role, but I understand that you're continuing to do a little consulting. Is that right? Uh, yes, I've got one more exhibition. In fact, I, I wrote an essay. The exhibition is entitled Whistler to Cassatt, and it opens up in Denver uh, November 2021 and then goes to the Virginia Museum of Art. And it's about American artists who worked in France uh, from around 1855 to 1913. And uh, I wrote an essay on facture, which is actually Finnish, or uh, the appearance of paint on a surface. And that was a, an interesting concept for artists working in the second half of the 19th century. When you have people like Homer who goes over to France and, and simply says, fine, <laughs> Um, he he really didn't. Uh, I mean, he, he he went more as a as a tourist than anything else. But uh, it, he wanted to see his painting in a salon. But here he's he he really wasn't influenced either way. But there are others like Aikens who who had a, a really horrible time trying to manage colors. And uh, along. A with that, I started to paint oil painting, and I, I discovered that that really informed my writing because I could understand the challenges that uh, Whistler Aikens, even um, Hopper, who spent time over there, um, as well as Mary Cassatt and others, how they really reacted to um, what was going on in terms of the salons and the academy. Uh, as well as the independent uh, workshops and masters. So, and roundabout way that that answered your question a little so, bit. <laughs> so do you do you, um, uh, do you think that uh, and not not to slam other curators by any by any stretch, but do you think that uh, they can even come close to understanding what you've discovered by learning to paint? Because it, it seems to me this is more of a consumer thing than it would be a curator thing, but there is this misnomer uh, that these people, um, from, from anybody, any artist historically or any artist living, there is this misnomer uh, among those who don't know that these people just picked up a brush one day and they were magically talented. And that, uh, you know, we, we, we believe uh, a, as a culture that if you want to be a brain surgeon, you got to go through eight or 10 years of school. You've got to get all this education. You can't just start doing brain surgery yet. We, we tend to think that, uh, that artists just magically have this ability. Do you think that that's something that curators believe or do they really understand the struggle that that went through that i don't think they understand the struggle um i sometimes talk about um how can you write about shakespeare's sonnets without understanding the rules of of making a sonnet uh in terms of paintings and drawings there are are so many challenges that that artists face with uh, technical means that they have to overcome Maybe what's happened is that ideation, uh, as well as iconography and content, has taken over the past couple of decades in terms of art history. So when art history is taught, it's about subject matter. It's really not about uh, stylistic shifts and connoisseurship. Uh, I, I think there's room for both, but I think that what's happened is that a, a complete understanding of the of how of the technical means of making paintings and sculpture, but let's keep it to two dimensions, um, are enormous, and you can you can only begin to identify with that if you've, you've taken any 
classes. I remember, I think, I, 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 I don't know for sure, but a number of art history programs have dropped the studio component of graduate programs. And that would have been uh, so enlightening to many simply because they, you know, uh, touching uh, chalk to paper and how you position your hand, how much pressure you put to it, how you twist, turn, uh, is going to affect mark making and that's going to uh, affect the meaning uh, that one is giving to a, a work of art. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm with you, Eric. Sometimes uh, there are labels that are written uh, of art history since Gaia that go on and on and on. I mean, at least I've had a, a great group of uh, colleagues at the Denver Art Museum where we had mutual respect of understanding label writing that um, an extended label should be 75 words, a uh, section label maybe 125 words because people won't read anymore. And if they want to know more, they'll go ahead and find it. But at least they've got the original work of art to stimulate them to further their research and study on, on those works of art. Uh, but it, it's, um, it, it's so uh, captivating to know uh, how much goes into to making works of art. And, and uh, the other thing that I, I found amazing is how hard artists works, work. Uh, didn't Chuck Close say, you know, I go to work every day. Um, it, it's not just dilettantism. It's something that's extraordinarily uh, taxing and it takes a great deal of discipline. All the artists that I've written on, uh, they work nine to five seven days a week. I asked a couple of artists, what do you do on vacation? And they said, we think about painting. Um, Tim, T. Allen Lawson, his family says, uh, sorry, you're not going to be painting on vacation. <laughs> Which only shows you. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's very hard work. It is very and hard work. And as Andy, Andy Wyeth said, it, it's exhausting at times. But you know, I've also learned in, in uh, being an art historian, and I've I've written on uh, uh, British watercolor landscape sketching in an exhibition catalog, Glorious Nature, British Landscape Painting, 1750 to 1850. And I, I learned that um, one of the reasons why British watercolor painting uh, grew and burgeoned throughout the 19th century is because they, they had popular picturesque sketching. So there were instruction manuals, there were uh, guidebooks as to tell you where to stand for a picturesque view. There were uh, ex instruction manuals with little uh, hand-colored tips of colored paper to show you here's how you match the color. And that informed the broader public and gave them discernment so that they could begin to understand what the artists were doing and uh, accept um, their brilliance as well as their mastering of various techniques. And, and I think that's what, what you're doing in the broader field of publications, as well as holding all of these various events. It informs a broader public so that we begin to collectively recognize excellencies in painting in a, a realistic mode, realistic vernacular. And what's happened, unfortunately, in the past couple of decades is that, is that um, the broader, let's say, many tastemakers have, have uh, misunderstood that it's not just replicating uh, nature. It's, it, it actually deals with a great deal of intelligence and thought and and that goes into making landscapes so even though you go out and, and plain air paint you still have to make artistic decisions and those decisions are, are equally informed by one's measure of how much art history you have but also uh, your training your technical knowledge uh, and all packaged together as well as your audience because artists want to have a dialogue with uh, visitors who are going to look at their pictures and what closes the, the entire 
dialogue is is actually talking about works of art that were produced by these artists and and their viewers. It it, it appears to me that <clears throat> there are. Um... You, you know, the, the tastemakers, as you refer to, are, are oftentimes, they're so obsessed with uh, what I would call modern modern art or modernism, abstract, what, whatever the, the title is, that they have almost uh, looked at what we do as something that's been done before, so it doesn't need to be done anymore. Why do you think that is? Or do you? Um, well... I mean, there are, are, are individuals writing today who are a little bit more balanced, such as Peter Sachel of the, of the New Yorker. I, I'm, I'm fascinated that he led the revival, in fact, one of the revivals of Norman Rockwell in a 1974 review and said, what's not to like? I mean, he's as good as us. Look at, look at uh, Willem de Kooning. Uh, when Sachel went out to de Kooning's studio in Long Island, he turned to de Kooning and saw this book, Norman Rockwell. And he said, Rockwell? And de Kooning took the book, opened up a page, shoved it in Sachel's face and said, look, he's one of us. He's just as good as us. He's an incredible painter. I think what's happening is that uh, people just aren't looking at works of art for their own criteria of evaluation. So it, it's kind of like judging a Volkswagen on a Mercedes standard. They're both diff apples and oranges. They're different. And uh, I think if people just relax and suspend their beliefs as to what constitutes a work of art and begins to work out the problem solving that is involved in individual works, uh, that we'd all be better off and we'd all be able to have a collective dialogue, whether it's um, non-objective painting or abstract painting or working in a realistic vernacular. I mean, there, there are just brilliant painters out there that are, that really should be uh, recognized um, on, on a broader scale. There, there, but, are, there um, are painters today that, <clears throat> that are every bit as good as any painter in history who are not getting that recognition. No, I know. I know. And it's, um, it's sad that, uh, I mean, well, uh, let's look at the positive. How do we change that? We change it through your efforts. We change it through my efforts of getting people enthused and excited about looking and looking in the proper way. And, um, and I think, um, sharing that with uh, colleagues in the industry, in the museum industry, as well as among collectors. It, it's only going to work with, with, a, with a broader public uh, that, that, that begins to recognize um, what many of these artists are doing. And, um, and, and that'll take some time and, and the tide will turn. You know, it's interesting to me because you, you, you look at the newsstand uh, where, where, you know, a lot of consumers have a, an opportunity to be influenced and pick something up. And, and uh, Plein Air magazine on Bar at Barnes & Noble nationally is the number one selling art magazine in America. It outsells all the art and all the photography magazines. And it, it has, it, it's a term that nobody even knows. And I think it's I, I think what's happening there is it's that beautiful image on the cover that I think people are drawn to. You know, there's a, a lot of evidence about museum shows, and you know this better than anyone else, that um, uh, I, I sometimes think that museum, um, wh whoever's making determinations about what some of the museums do, I think they're bored with the past, and so they want to do something fresh and new. And yet you look at what happened to the the, you know, the show at the Met, the sergeant show at the Met, where there were lines around the block. I, I think that people are still interested, but I think that the, again, going back to the tastemakers, uh, we've got to figure out how to get them interested. And I, I agree, it yeah. starts with the public, but I wonder sometimes if they're listening to the public. Um, <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> 
I, um, you know, the, the, there are two jobs for every museum director across the country that are, are at the forefront of his or her direction. And that is one, fundraising, and number two, the program. And the program of an institution, uh, I think, uh, is, a, is a, a, an interesting place to start because that's a dialogue that should take place with a, a broader uh, constituency of individuals, very much the way we did at the Denver Art Museum. And that is that it's made up of about a half dozen people that meet weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, and we figure out, figured out a, a schedule with beacon exhibitions and then uh, going into maybe more experimental exhibitions. Uh, but there's always that money component, uh, i.e. the beacon exhibitions, which would bring in many, uh, that would help pay for those other kinds of exhibitions. Also, I think there needs to be a broader dialogue as to what do our broader constituencies, what would they like to see and how would they like to have it represented? And, um, and I think that uh, maybe in the realm of contemporary curators, there needs to be an opening dialogue that says, you know, it doesn't have to be cutting edge all the time and it doesn't have to be... Um, you know, blue chip modernism, that it can involve uh, what's taking place um, elsewhere um, by by many of these local artists um, all across the country. And that could be one of the ways to increase the the, uh, visibility and the consciousness of uh, many of the artists who who paint in this realist uh, vernacular. Yeah, and of course, asking asking people who don't know is sometimes a problem too. Yeah, I'll tell you a quick story. Is uh, my nephew, who is probably 32, 33 years old, was with one of his internet millionaire buddies in Las Vegas, and they wandered into a photography gallery, and this guy dropped a million dollars on a beautiful photograph. A million dollars. It it was it hit the record books. As a matter of fact, it was in the media. First million dollar. Paint uh, photograph sold or something like that, and mm-hmm. I said to him, you know, for a million dollars, he probably could have had uh, a, a phenomenal masterwork, some something, you know, he certainly could have had a Bouguereau or something like that. And he said, "What's that?" And he, he said, "You <laughs> have to." He said, "You have to keep in mind that when I was in school, they ripped that away from us. We, we didn't have any art classes. We didn't have any art appreciation. He said, my generation doesn't know anything about art. He said, my friend would probably buy those paintings that you talked about if, if someone would just tell him about them. He said, your job is to educate them and educate us. Well, I, I think you're doing a good job. I mean, you've, you've got a brilliant editor in Peter Trippi. Who, I do. I'm uh, very proud of that. Who, you really do, and he he knows how to make those articles accessible to a broader public, which is is so important. But you know, but you know, for 30 years when I worked as a curator, I I worked with a number of uh, local individuals and tried to help and help them build collections, and you know, you don't tell somebody. Uh, Premier Cru Bordeaux when they only understand Thunderbird. And, and so, and, and then at the same time, when we're going to art fairs, I would tell them, don't buy Baltic, buy Park Place, at least buy a utility, at least buy a railroad, but, but don't. (laughs) Um, And so it it takes a a little bit bit of uh, controlling and intimidation and, and persuasion and uh, education and handholding. Uh, I mean, a number of moneyed people are, are extraordinarily bright and they're quick learners. And I think that's one of the ways in which if we had uh, a broader uh, communal activity uh, in terms of our, our, our curators educating the broader public instead of simply uh, cutting edge contemporary works or um, other kinds of blue chip works, 
uh, you know, don't buy works of art uh, as trophy collecting. Buy works of art so that you can uh, learn and develop and, and form uh, your own knowledge along the way as you're, you're building the co- collection. And it's, it's, uh, it's a diplomatic art. It's, it's not easy, and not everybody has that kind of skill set either. So what is that process like in terms of, uh, you, you know, somebody might be listening to this who's a, a collector or wannabe collector, you know, maybe has gone to some plein air shows and seen some artists and trying to develop an eye. But, they, you know, at, at, I know in my own particular case, when I was really green at this, you know, I was drawn to things that were almost photorealistic. You know, the, the, the one compliment you get when you're out painting, which is actually not a compliment for most of us is, Oh, it looks just like a photograph. Right. And, and so, right. How, you know, how do you, how do we develop these, these people so that they can develop a sense of taste and not, not being critical of what, okay. they, what they've picked. What's, right. What's your process? I understood. Very, very well. Number one, I mean, you have to start off with uh, a sense of passion I mean, it, uh, it doesn't matter how much art history you, you give or how much information. If you don't have a passion for what you're doing, that's number one for working with various individuals. You want to show uh, that this is exciting, this is fun, this is, um, you know, it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor because it enriches all of us. Uh, and some people have money that can, can buy really wonderful things, but you want to um, get them as enthusiastically involved as you are and say, this is why this is important and, and begin to teach discernment. You know, it's very much like teaching people how to drink wine. It, it, it's based on varietals and, and you start with varietals and then you, you deal with terroir and you deal with nationalities, but, um, and so it's the same with, with works of art, uh, going to fairs and say, um, I, I would uh, advise people to get trusted individuals who, who are knowledgeable and, and who are pretty much like Switzerland, they're neutral, and they'll give an unsugared commentary about works of art, both to the, the sellers as well as to the buyers. You know, the... The best way to do it is be honest and not sugared and, and not say, oh, well, this is great just to make a sale. Uh, but you really want to have people begin to understand for themselves that, yes, this is going to work in your living room in this. And that our second piece is going to be something that's going to relate to that either thematically, stylistically or iconographically. I remember one person, I, I went to their home and I walked through the whole thing. He was a, a new trustee and, and uh, he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, this is, it's horrible. It, it's really a horrible collection. I mean, you, you had a designer who purchased all these pictures for your installation and they're, they're completely inappropriate for these various spaces and rooms. So he turned to the lot of us, there were half a dozen there, and he said, okay, we're just going to take the corporate jet to New York and go buy paintings. And I said, no, 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 it's not like going to a Walmart where we're going to fill up the cart. We're just going to do this over the next couple of years, and we're going to do it slowly, and, and, uh, and we'll bring works to your attention that will be appropriate for these various spaces. And I'm really proud of that. And I, I think that individual really loves those works of art um, that make sense in the spaces and, and hopefully had learned a great deal. So that's, I hope that answers part of the question. Well, it uh, does, but it answers part of the question, but it raises other questions. And, and, and one of them is that this is a concept that, that most of us have not heard, myself included, and and that is, how, how do you determine that a painting is appropriate for a space? Yeah, well, um, you it's you opened it's the can of worms now. 
Well, right, uh, because um, two people could agree, but the third person doesn't. Um, it's it's not easy. It's not not easy. You you simply have to keep talking, uh, and it's it you get, sometimes you have to reach a compromise and say, okay, fine. Um, but you're not ta- you're action, not talking about point. the designer saying, oh, there's purple in it. It matches the couch. No, no. This these are are uh, people who are actually no, no designers. No, this is just uh, people collecting works of art and acquiring. I should say acquiring works of art, and you're helping them understand why it's significant. I also, you know. Um, uh, is this a work of art that the museum would want to acquire? Absolutely. And uh, is this something that's uh, close to that? Yes. Um, so, uh, and and also you you have to anticipate uh, how much time and effort they want to put into the the entire event of of acquiring works of art. How important uh, is it? How many fairs? I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. How many? How important no, is well, it? How important is it that uh, these people love what they're buying? It seems seems that that should be important because they're going to live with uh, it. Yes, and because because I tell them uh, do not buy works of art as investment. Uh, you're going to you're going to live with this, and and moreover, you want to get something that's going to grow with you. You'll see something different with this. You're fortunate enough to have a Monet in your in your home, and um, you're lucky enough to notice how sensitively that was painted uh, on plein air, and um, and all the problems that he had solved to overcome and create this uh, beautiful scene, and um, and, and and it's worked. <laughs> uh, people really love their Monets and um, and other works of art. So that's what I I try to work on. Uh, show my enthusiasm, and then they become curious and say, well, "Why are you so excited about that? Why why is this making you so excited instead of that other picture?" We, let's say we've got two monies. We've got three monies. Why are you excited about this one as against those other ones? And then you, you explain, um, uh, just go through a, a whole variety of, of factors. But th- this comes from, from uh, 30 years being a curator of um, having a trained eye and, and also having experience in the field. Yeah, well, that's why having somebody like you to help is, is enormously important. Um, uh, you, you just raised another question in my head, just thinking about that. I, I remember hearing a story of, I think it was Wildenstein, Wildenstein uh, in New York, the dealer, uh-huh. who uh, four or five generations, three generations ago, whatever, um, you know, discovered uh, a lot of these impressionists and a lot of the painters in Europe and just became their patron and just bought up everything that he could and filled a, a warehouse that would fuel a, uh, you know, a hundred year business. And, uh-huh. um, and of course I wonder, I'd love to have seen that warehouse and what was in it. And I wonder if, you know, some of what was filled up were, were things that never became of any value or of any significance. If, if you were um, given a, a somewhat unlimited budget today, put you on the spot here. And, uh, and I said, look, I, I want to fill up a warehouse of things that a painters today, living painters today, who people are going to look back on in 50 years, a hundred years, uh, maybe some of which haven't even been discovered yet. Who, who would you buy? What would you buy? <laughs> or, or I, or, yeah, Go ahead. Or, or maybe it's not so much specific painters, but maybe it's uh, specific topics or content or styles, et cetera. I, I do have a big sympathy for 
contemporary as well. Contemporary, um, non-objective, or, or uh, let's say contemporary is against realist painting. But uh, what would I go out and buy? I would go out and buy things that are... I just have to uh, coin it as integral. Um, in, in other words, they're, it, it's very much like an, uh, analyzing an, a, a novel. You know, uh, the lie has to be honest throughout the entire work of fiction. And as soon as that lie is betrayed, as soon as the dialogue falters, you stop reading and throw the book against the wall and say, I'm not going to finish that novel. And it's the same thing for a work of art, uh, whether it's it's realist or not. Um, I I would look for you know what's really integral in 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 that artist's oeuvre, the corpus of works that that really works on all six pistons. Yeah. And uh, and that goes back to. Ben Sean forms the shape of content. I mean, um, th- th- there's an interaction between the final project product and, and the methods that went into making it. Um, Mark Bradley, um, uh, Julian Mario, um, uh, Gerhard Richter, I, I, I just love. Um, it, um, but I'm a little bit rusty because I've, I've been, I haven't been to many fairs recently. <laughs> Nobody has. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, um, th- there, there are some, some it, it's hard to see answer that eric at, at the moment yeah well and i and, and and i put you on the spot a little bit too in, in terms of best advice you've got a, a lot of artists around the world who are listening to this who are part of this massive plein air movement that that has kind of cropped up the last 10 15 years um i think all of us secretly quietly probably yourself included i don't know Maybe we have delusions that maybe one day we'll get discovered and one day we'll, we'll be in a museum. What, what is your best advice to any artist in terms of development of their work or development of their careers? Uh, the advice that I give a lot of artists and mentor, um, keep working. Uh, um, Sometimes I've, I've, I've seen artists go into a networking mode uh, as against um, a working mode. And I, I would simply say, you, you know, the, the world will find you, the world will, will discover you. And, and there's this urgency to have this dialogue on the part of the artist. And I, I, I understand that and I recognize that. But uh, there's nothing that replaces hard work and uh, discovery and problem solving from the hard work that comes into patterns. Number two, uh, establish a network with other artists in your community uh, so that there's some sense of camaraderie while you're working with an entirely uh, solitary uh, existence. I mean, it's, you know, you're all by yourself. Well, and, and that also think, informs uh, that also informs the growth because if you're if you're stuck in your studio and you're not seeing what other people are doing, you're you know you're not going to be challenged to experiment yourself. Right. The, the other thing is is just having informal critiques with others, uh, um, visiting studios and talking about paintings, and uh, it, it's it's really helpful to have other people articulate when they look at your painting and go, Oh, this is what's going on or not going on. And, and that's, that's also leads to further discovery on the part of, of an artist in, in making works of art. Um, then there's that network component, uh, which is important, but it shouldn't dominate. 
Um, and and I, I guess just being clever about um, keeping that network that, that really works for you as much as you can and, and learning from all of this. But, you know, your workshops that you've been putting together have been extremely informative in helping the nuts and bolts of how to become an artist, how to move forward, uh, maybe how to network with local curators and and <clears throat> local dealers as well as local uh, collectors. It's it's all of the above, but uh, the primary component is that that very much hard work in the studio. All right, excellent. So um, we yeah. have a few minutes left. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about maybe. A, a little bit of art history, some of some of your favorite artists, um, and, and why they've become important to you. I'm just curious about that because you you have such good taste. You've written how many books have you written? Oh come on, <laughs> I I've just written. I read very hard. I uh, wrote uh, a, a number of essays on Poussin. Um, I'm finishing a catalog resume on Giovanni Benedetto Castiglione. I've published on Dugas, Rembrandt, uh, and many others, and, and done many exhibition reviews. I, my most recent review is on Hopper, Hopper in the Hotel, which was a great exhibition, uh, which is a great sign of, of, of recognition of a realist painter, uh, the laconic uh, Edward Hopper, uh, both at Richmond and the, Virginia Museum of Art, and then moved on to Indianapolis. Great show. But um, what, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I just loved Van Gogh. I loved um, Degas. I loved Wyeth, uh, Rembrandt. But uh, an oddball out is perhaps uh, Nicholas Poussin. Yeah. And it's probably that I'm, I'm attracted to him because uh, he's such a challenge. And um, if any artist is going to put a survey class to sleep quicker than Nodos, it's going to be Nicholas Poussin. And so I think I've got a lifelong ambition to um, try to get the world excited about this French artist. I got very excited. When, when I went to the, there's a beautiful little museum in Enfleur, and I got very excited about his work um, when I saw the collective, especially the plein air works. They had such energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but Eric, isn't this great to have this kind of discussion? Absolutely. This is what this is. This is additional advice to all those artists: have a dialogue. You know. Um, Put your mask on, stay, stay six feet apart, <laughs> have a coffee with somebody else, uh, but um, keep the dialogue go going along with the visual dialogue uh, because the two go hand in hand. Well, and, it's and been what, so I, wonderful what I have tried very hard to do it. is to create this dialogue between artists. You know, that we, we have had um, hundreds and hundreds of artists who have become friends with others by coming to an event like the plein air convention, which by the way is coming to Denver and, and to be able to connect and to sit down and have lunch with and, and just dialogue about art and, you know, learn about what others are doing and what inspires them, what techniques have worked for them and so on. And, and, and I, it reminds me of the cafes of France, you know, that when, when um, the Impressionists would get together at the cafes right. and, and dialogue, I'm sure they were arguing about things all the time. And that's, that's what I really hope to have happen is, you know, I'm trying to create a, a giant dinner table where there's a giant worldwide movement of dialogue that's going on. And we're now seeing, interestingly enough, it all started in Europe. And then it came to America and then Europe forgot about it. And and then America forgot about it. Now that we're seeing this resurgence, and now it's starting to spread back to Europe. We're now seeing plein air shows across Ireland and England and France and some other, other locations. And it's all because of this dialogue that's been taking place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, 
uh, I would say um, I was timid and, and went incognito to your first plein air, con- one of your conventions. I, I uh, but I loved it. I loved it. And I learned so much. So it's a great sense of encouragement to many listeners. Don't hesitate. Uh, you, you, you may think I don't know how to hold on to a brush or not. That's not important. You will learn and you'll have a great time. Uh, on my refrigerator, I've got Michelangelo's little dictum, never stop learning. So one last question. Uh, you mentioned you were doing a catalog resume for someone. Uh, what should I or other artists be thinking about as, you know, someday, maybe if we're lucky enough that somebody's going to want to do a catalog resume on us? What would, what's missing that you wish the artist had done? Well, um, Giovanni Benedetto Castiglione's date, 1609 to 1664, he didn't have a resident re- registrar. Uh, so I would record all the works of art, if you can, when they go out, at least uh, keep a thumb- thumbnail image recto inverso of the work who has it measurement size uh you never know what's going to happen with your your corpus of works of art um and any other information along with that i i wish there was some kind of uh statement i'd love to hear my artist's voice Uh, the only time i hear his voice is in depositions and and legal documents from uh, 1655 from a, a big trial, um, but um, and maybe some kind of uh, chronology, which is extremely helpful for people in the future to sort of understand that uh, maybe uh, this is how works of art were dated uh, on the recto or the verso of, of those works of art. And the catalog resume is all the works uh, by an artist, and so. Uh, uh, the difficulty is that uh, Giovanni Benedetto Castiglione worked with his brother Salvatore, his son Francesco Cal- Castiglione, and and so it's about four or five hundred works of art that have to be sorted out as to which ones were original, which ones may have been done by collaborative method. Uh, so it's it's been taking me about forty four years, and and so that ninety five percent, I've got five percent more to finish it. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge job. Well, I, I think that a, a lot of us, you know, don't really ever expect to be somebody who's going to be written about, but you'd be surprised. And, and, and you, I, you are, you know, you I, are. I did a thing a, a, on my noon Facebook, YouTube daily the other day with John Potoshnik and to see how organized this man was. He had every image, every sketch in a notebook numbered, filed away. And I thought, you know, somebody does a book on him in 100 years. They're going to love discovering his archive. Uh, Clay Zoldenberg did that. I think he, he numbered all of his sketchbooks. Um, it, it's really helpful. for, but, but it's also when you look back, you know, you might want to go back to your sketchbooks a couple of years prior to that time. And you'll again, have a self-discovery. Right. You'll go, Oh my God, look at the, look at what I was doing then. And I didn't recognize it then, but I do now. So do you show any of what your, a reward? do you show any of your go artwork? Ahead. Is there a place we can see your work? Uh, standardwatercolors.com. Uh, and um, there are some works at uh, Kitchell Fine Arts in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, Claggett Ray up in Edward, Colorado. Excellent. Um, and somebody told me to, to work on my Instagram, but okay. um, <laughs> there's only so much one can do. <laughs> well, you're retired now. You have all the time in the world, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Uh, the only thing that's changed is my email address. Yeah. But well, well, thank Eric, you, thank you so wonderful. much for doing this today. This was absolutely fantastic, very informative. I, I, I tried to give you as much misinformation as possible. Anyway, <laughs> well, 
Well, thanks again to Timothy Standring, and I find him fascinating. I think it's absolutely amazing what he's done, and uh, you want to get some of the books that he's done. They're absolutely incredible. Are you guys ready for some marketing ideas? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Well, in the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions. I haven't been stumped yet, but I'm sure somebody will stump me at some point. I mean, it's bound to happen, right? Anyway, email your questions to me, eric at artmarketing.com. And if you want to check out the website, artmarketing.com, there's tons of articles I've written about art marketing. Here's a question from Kathy Ringenberger in Indianapolis who asked, is it a good idea to list your prices on your website for your paintings or on your social media? And if so, why or why not? I've always wondered this because if people don't see the price, how are they supposed to know how much it is? And some artists don't do it, some do it. So what's the right way? I don't think I can say there's a right way or a wrong way, Kathy. I think that the way to say it is you got to make your choices. Now, I, I will tell you a story Uh, A dealer friend of mine in uh, the, I'll just say in Texas, dealer friend of mine in Texas uh, was having this great debate about whether or not he should put prices on his website because no dealers were doing that at the time. This is a few years back. And uh, I said, I think you should. I, I would put my prices on there because the internet is all about instant gratification. And if I am in another country or if I'm uh, sitting up at four o'clock in the morning, I browse around, I see something, I want to be able to buy it. I don't want to have to pick up the phone and call you. And his argument was, yeah, but I, if I get them on the phone, I can talk to them and talk them through it and help sell them. And my argument was, yeah, but you might not get them on the phone. Most people don't want to get on the phone anymore, and some will, some won't, but you need to be able to sell it anyway. So he took a chance on it. He did an experiment, and he put his prices on the website. Right away, right away, I just felt so totally vindicated here, right? So right away, he gets a uh, uh, an order that came in at like four o'clock in the morning. Just like I said, it would happen. It was from some foreign country, and the order was for get this six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a big piece of sculpture. This was a top tier gallery, six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now. When he arrived the next morning, he had a wire transfer for the money in his bank account. And he was able to confirm it and be able to send the sculpture and pack it up and send it to wherever it was, Brazil or something, I think. And and so from that point forward, he always put his prices on his website. Now, some dealers still don't do it. Um, Some artists don't do it. I, you know, I think it's debatable, but I, I think, you know, in this, this culture, I mean, we're, we're going on Amazon and we're shopping for things. We want to be able to have instant gratification. Uh, and I think that art really is the same way. And so I would do it. That's what I think is the proper way to do it. And you also can have opportunities to upsell for framing or, or you know, pick a different frame or things like that. Most of the website providers provide things like that now. So I think it's a really good idea. I, you know, again, it's debatable, but I, I think it's worth a try. And if you have a, a reason why it's a bad idea, let me know. I'd like to hear it. Next question comes from Randy in New York City, or Randall, excuse me, who says, it seems that the best artists rise to the top and are working, and, and that working on your art and getting to the highest possible level of development is the most important thing to become famous. Uh, would you agree? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things in here. First off, this sounds like a trick question. I know it's not, Randall, but the, the famous, you know, what's more important? Is it more important to be famous or is it more important to be successful? Is fame successful? You can be famous and not make any money. Is that what you want? Do you want to be famous and successful financially? You know, you got to figure out what you want. But um, here's the problem. Uh, it seems like it should be the case. I mean, you would think that the universe would do that. You spend your life working on your work, you get really good at it, and you put it out there, and then uh, it just automatically gets recognized. And that happens sometimes. I mean, people do get discovered. They do get recognized from the quality of their work. And clearly, quality tends to rise to the top and gets the higher prices. But if you don't put it out there, 
uh, sometimes it's not going to be seen. You know, what if you don't just dis- get discovered? What if you don't get a gallery? What if you don't find an agent? What if you don't get seen? I have seen so many instances and learned about so many people throughout my career of people who uh, are brilliant painters who have never been discovered. I had uh, I was uh, had an opportunity. I was asked to come to England to try and talk a particular painter into getting out there and going into the market. And uh, because he was so shy, he didn't want to do it. And he had, it was a brilliant artist and he, he wouldn't even sell his work. And he, in his particular case, he just didn't want to do it. And, and, but uh, there have been so many instances of people who wanted to do it, but they didn't, uh, they, you know, they just never got anybody interested in them. So I think the thing is that, that uh, selling your work is a lifetime effort. As long as you're going to be selling your work, you're going to have to be somewhat, um, assertive, some would say aggressive. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. I mean, let's say you're at a cocktail party and you meet an art dealer and uh, you're so shy that you won't even say, hey, I'm an, I'm an artist and I'd like you to look at my work. Well, you know, first off, art dealers get that so many times they may not pay attention to it. But they also might say, uh, uh, yeah, I would like to look at your work, but some people are so shy. You know, marketing is sometimes just a matter of raising your hand and telling people what you're up to. It doesn't have to be anything beyond that. But uh, a lot of people think marketing is um, something they don't need to do. They don't need marketing skills. They think marketing is crass for some reason. Uh, But some have been lucky and gotten out there. Some have not. So I would say that you've got to be really sensitive to the idea that learning marketing is important. Let's, let's say this. You know, I think a, a great thing for an artist is to eventually get a, a two or three great galleries, maybe more, or to get a great handler, maybe somebody to work for you, maybe somebody to be your, your uh, agent. But, you know, the reality is that um, usually you have to do some marketing and build some some awareness before somebody wants to do it. It's like galleries want to go after successful people. They want proven people. Sometimes they're not willing to take the risk. And so you got to get out there. So learning and discovering marketing, go to artmarketing.com, check it out, see if you can find some things that might be of value to you. I think you might find it to be helpful. Um, Anyway, I think that's, uh, I think that's the answer. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. All right. A reminder to get registered for Realism Live soon. Uh, It is an online conference. There's a $200 price increase at the end of September, and it's going to be a massive conference. There's already 1,200 people signed up. So go to realismlive.com. Be part of this phenomenon. You will not regret it. There's a money-back guarantee. If you attend and after the first day you just don't think it's worth your money, you let us know. We'll send your money back. We'll cut you off. You don't have to attend the rest of the thing. And uh, so there's no risk, and it's going to be amazing. People have said it's like a fire hose into a teacup of information. That's what they said about Plan Air Live. Realism Live is going to be uh, also incredible. It's just a broader topic range, right? So it's not just plein air painting. It's landscape. It's still life. It's portrait. It's figure. All the things that we all want to do, mostly want to do. Anyway, uh, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about art and life and other things, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can find it at coffeewitheric.com. And remember, Fall Color Week is still going on. And you can register at Fall colorweek.com. Get to paint some color. If you don't live around the color, it's a great thing to do. And we're going to do it live. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.